why do we need these high purity metals? Um, well, the impurities affect all the properties. And I guess the best way to relate it to you is if you're going to cook a very nice meal for your significant other, you're going to start with good produce, good meats, uh, high quality fresh products, unless he prefers hot dogs. But you want steak or hot dog? Well, you got to start with good stuff. And the end taste of that meal is going to be a lot different. Well, for the scientists, the uh, things you want to know, you want to know what the intrinsic property of your material you're looking at. And that is, what is truly the physics of that material? Uh, what is the real lattice parameter? What is the real crystal structure? What is its true melting point? Uh, all these factors over here. Uh, if you have impurities, you shift the stoichiometry of the alloy. You can get second phases, which are um, materials of different crystal structures mixed in with your material of interest. Um, it can affect things like crystal growth. Dr. Gunter Baer visited us and gave us a nice presentation a couple years ago about how the effect of oxygen uh, determines the quality of your crystal when you're growing crystals. And the example I like to give is silicon. Pure silicon is very different than impure silicon. Very pure silicon is an insulator, adds some phosphorus to it, it becomes a semiconductor, and you can exploit the difference in the physics between the two. And if you're watching this on a computer, well, you're experiencing the joys of silicon in your computer. Here's an example of work we've done on how the purity of materials have been affected or affect the properties. Uh, this blue chart here is the entropy change, and you can do a calculation to make that a temperature change of gadolinium silicon germanium made from very high purity materials. Uh, they want to use this material to, as a prototype, or they have used it as a prototype for magnetic refrigeration purposes. But if you take a lower quality gadolinium and silicon, this is the entropy change. And you're not going to get a lot of work out of, ooh, I keep hitting that with my elbow. You're not going to get a lot of temperature change with that little available entropy. Pure gadolinium actually sits slightly above these two lower humps. So you've lost all this available work. Well, what's more important is, if this were the starting material for the research for, on gadolinium silk and germanium, they may never have discovered this large change. And that's what it's all about. The physicists want to know what is the true nature of this material. And the impurities may mask the true nature of the material. In this case, we're suppressing a structural change, which adds to the entropy. But if you don't know what you really, really got, do you really understand the physics? And as I like to say, the physicists like to, squiggle, to argue over whose squiggly line is correct. Well, the better materials you start with might give you the best squiggly line. And we all know we want to keep our physicists happy, because if your physicist isn't happy, nobody's happy. Here's an example of uh, some material that is currently of interest to this physics world, the terbium aluminum boron, uh, most recently published in Science, an article on it. Uh, our, these, these are our clients here that have used our material in these two papers, which is associated with this one, to create this material that has a quantum critical point. Now, I'm not going to explain that to you, but I can tell you the physics, physicists love this quantum critical point and the fact that it shows up in this material without being coerced by ultra-high pressures or other outside influences really gets them excited. So the question remains is, if we didn't have access to high purity materials, would we see this interesting physics? Therefore, would we be able to exploit that interesting physics to do things like make devices or products? Now, I'll step out here and make a political statement. I think the physics, the, uh, not physics, but the materials research community is damaging itself because 15 years ago, 20 years ago, it was almost an absolute requirement to list in your, art of, in your paper where you got your materials. Today, they rarely list where they got their materials. And I believe that has such an important impact what is the quality and source of your materials for the research that they should be publishing that in all their uh, research papers. So if you're writing a research paper, make sure you include that. It means you're doing a better job than everybody else, at least with respect to that. 
Now let's get back to the, to the making of the rare earths. Uh, we're going to comment on where we start. And it really starts with the inputs. Like I said before, there's two ways to make it. You can either start with high purity materials and keep it pure, or you can find some slick way to get your impurities out. Uh, this is a picture of praseodymium oxide. Rare earth oxides are uh, very colorful. They come in whites, purples, and yellows. Uh, praseodymium oxide looks black. Well, this is very high purity. Five nines, as we'll call it. See down here. What that means is there's only 10 part per million impurity in it. For every million atoms, 10 of them are something other than what we want. And that's pretty darn pure. It's also expensive to buy because it takes a lot of effort to get there. However, garbage in, garbage out. If we start with a lot of impurities in our material, we're not going get to get them all out. So if we want to make the highest purity rare earth, raised in here, we've got to start with the highest purity oxide. Our next input is calcium. This is commercial calcium. We buy triple distilled com commercial calcium. That even sounds pure. Triple distilled commercial calcium. That's like buying extra virgin olive oil. It's, this has got to be, this has got to be good. However, triple distilled calcium has roughly two to 5,000 part per million oxygen in it. So if we start with that impurity in there, it'll probably stay throughout the process to some extent. So we sublime or distill our calcium further over the course of about a week, and we can make material that's got 10 part per million oxygen in it. So we can limit our oxygen exposure in our processing stream by starting with the best material possible. Uh, you have to handle this stuff carefully because if you don't handle it appropriately, you let it get exposed to air even for a few minutes, all that hard work into reducing the oxygen just gets destroyed. And we'll talk more about that at the end of the presentation. Uh, our process takes about six days to make 900 grams of this material. And we consume about 1,900 grams when we make cerium, for example, and 500 grams when we make lutetium. Tantalum is one of our inputs, and I couldn't get any of my technicians to pose for a picture of holding a tantalum crucible, so we had to use our mascot beaker here. Um, tantalum is not something that chemically helps us make the rare earth by reducing anything. It is simply the crucible material we make it in. It's the, it's the bowl in which we cook our, cook our dinner. There are lots of options for crucible materials. Aluminum, magnesia, quartz, there are several. However, the rare earths are some of the most uh, reactive materials available. They've got some of the highest free energy of formation of oxides. In other words, they'd rather be an oxide than anything else in most respects. So a lot of our oxide-based crucibles are unusable. We could use graphite, but the rare earths love graphite. A lot, of, a lot of metals you can cast in iron. No, can't do that with the rare earths. So we're less, left with tantalum. Problem is tantalum is very expensive. 10 by 10 sheet that's about 30 mils thick uh, costs about $1,000. And you'll get to use it once or twice in the same process and you're done with it. But it may be a source of impurities. Uh, according to the ASTM standards for making tantalum, whether it be through powder, powder metallurgy processing or electron beam or vacuum arc remelting. Um, here's, here would be the purities for those. There's a little bit of oxygen in them, a little higher for the powder mat version. Uh, but iron is a concern. If there's a lot of iron in it, it might carry over into our metal. However, the tantalum, tantalum to, of today versus the tantalum available 20 years ago is a lot better. So we're not as concerned about impurities through, through the tantalum. If you really want clean tantalum, you do what we call pickle or acid etch it. And then you anneal it or degas it as you want, we call it, at a high temperature to clean up the material. The last input I'll talk about is hydrofluoric acid, which we use for uh, our process. This is a bottle of HF and water. We use anhydrous hydrofluoric acid. Um, we can see from this chart here, there's not a whole lot of impurities of concern for us. We pull the H off, HF off as a gas. So it comes off very clean. Maybe you'll get some carryover. This is a reaction product we'll deal with. This wouldn't affect us very much. We don't see any of this arsenic in it. Um, but the problem with the HF is it's really nasty stuff, and you have to give it the respect it's due. So a lot of commercial entities don't use the anhydrous hydrogen fluoride to 
because it's just not fun to work with. It's expensive, it's dangerous. If there's an easier way, an electrolytic method, or using like ammonium bifluoride to convert hydroxides, they'll use that instead. Now, you remember this picture from earlier. Uh, this is where we're gonna start talking about the specifics of how we make all the lanthanides that we make. This chart's not nearly as convenient in this form, so if we rearrange the chart, ordering it roughly by boiling point, we can see some breakdowns in how we might want to view these rare earths. Here we got low boiling points, moderate to low melting temperatures, moderate boiling points, a little higher boiling points, very high boiling points, which implies very low vapor pressure, moderate melting temperatures. So big gap here, smaller gap, smaller gap, smaller gap. So we break these down into our processing groups. You'll see what I call the big four over here. This is the light lanthanides and the mix of the heavy and light lanthanides through here. This is how we break down the processing groups and we'll see in a second what uh, differentiates them physically. Here's a flow chart and the number corresponds to where it was on that previous graph. And we're first gonna talk about what I call the big four, samarium, europium, thulium, ytterbium, because we make those directly from the oxides with the lanthanum reduction. These are the easiest to make. These are probably the next easiest to make. You're getting harder to make here, and this is the most difficult to make. And really the difference is, uh, one, we, this, is, this purifies itself really easily during the reduction process. These are not reactive with tantalum. You get more reactive with tantalum as you drop down in these groups. And remember, tantalum is our crucible material. So if you're reacting with your crucible material, you're eating through your crucible. So you'd be, if you're making your cake or cooking something and it, and it chews up your cookware, that's gonna, gonna be a problem, isn't it? That's kind of what happens here.